Okay, we are live. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Holy Humanist. Happy Saturday um, to everyone, whoever's watching around the world. I hope you're having a fabulous start to the weekend. Um, today, we have the one and only Hani Salim with us from Critical Faculty. Um, so Hani, massive, massive welcome to Holy Humanist. This is our first interaction. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. I'm very thrilled to be here. Oh no, I'm so so I'm so glad we did this because to be honest, I ha I came across your channel a while ago. I think it was through um, one of Derek um, Lambert's one of Myth Vision's podcasts. I think you came on, and I just heard like tidbits of your story and your exposure to both Islam and Christianity by virtue of like your background and you know your upbringing and things like that. And I was like, wow, I really need to like I would love to kind of like pick this man's story a bit more because you've kind of like played both sides of the coin if that makes makes sense um so yeah exactly and I, I have to say so first of all before we actually get stuck into it um guys the honey's channel is in the description and i will be pinning it in the chat as we move like along in this conversation so please do go ahead and subscribe we're going to talk about what honey's doing with his youtube channel as well but yeah i mean i save things they're just on in the background because genuinely even as an ex-muslim i i learned so much because you you go beyond that realm and now you're talking about things that are honestly interesting to somebody who's left the fold of religion behind and you're trying to unpack these more kind of philosophical scientific rational understandings and you're learning uh, along the way about how many other like religions and uh, dogmas that you come out of lead to the same thing so you've actually had people like Lawrence Lawrence Krauss on your podcast mm -hmm. and because you're bilingual you do amazing conversations in Arabic which my Arabic's very basic I wish I could understand that more <laughs> but I do save them to improve my Arabic um, but yeah, so please go ahead and subscribe. We will talk about it more and I'll pin it in the chat later on if you guys aren't convinced already. But yeah, so Hani, how are you doing? Very good, thank you very much. I'm all right. Uh, just had a broadcast a few hours ago with Dr. Robert Price talking oh. about abortion. <laughs> oh, wow, yes, that's extremely relevant at the moment, isn't it? Especially in the American context with what's exactly. happening. Yes. Yeah, and that's another thing I really do appreciate, uh, the fact that you have brought Robert Price on a number of times and kind of challenged the most, uh, like, you know, like insane allegations about like racism and you kind of had the the guts to have like platform him and say okay let's go through this one by one and here's where I agree and here's where I don't and that could be borderline interpreted wrongly so again massive kudos because not many people are willing to I mean in this like in this day and age with platforming people and the cancel culture it's so easy to just say no I don't want to host you know, anybody with views like that on my platform, but you kind of dive in the defense. So, yeah, that's I mean, just Nuria, how, yeah. how else are we going to change the world we live in? I mean, you can't change bad ideas by running away from them and then pretending they're not around. Uh, the only way to change things is by challenge them um, sort of uh, courageously. So I think having, uh, and this conversation today, he was completely on a different uh, opposite side of me. He, he was pro uh, life uh, and I was pro-choice but yeah. we thought well, let's have a dialogue to see how close can we get and um, amazingly we were so close to each other wow but, yeah okay. it wasn't that different because once you get into the detail and I put in front of him certain scenarios where um, uh, uh, choice of abortion might be the, the only logical and um, uh, the right thing to do he kind of accepted some of the positions but then I've also accepted some of his, he's, he's, he's an atheist. So he does not appeal to any supernatural realms whatsoever, but he thinks life is special. And I kind of right. agree, you yeah. know, not in a, in a, in a, in an egotistic way, but more in a, in, yes, we're here. I mean, the, the, the whole, the whole thing is made possible by us through being live. So I'm alive and therefore I can think and I can have a chat with you. So it's a, it's a little bit special. We're going to have yeah. to agree. Yeah, most definitely. And and I think the same, um, like kind of in a way, the Socratic discussion you had with him on the more racist thing as well was very interesting because I saw you were really trying to kind of be like, okay, where, how far can I go to meet you? How, how much can I push being in agreement with you 
before I say, okay, this is where I draw the line. And it's because re- you are having these conversations that are pushing those those boundaries and, and that that's amazing to watch. So um, yeah, I mean, please carry on doing what you're doing. We will talk about it more. I want to know like what, what sprung you into this. But for now, for obviously my viewers who don't really know you or haven't come across you in the same way, if you could just please kind of give us a, a little snapshot into who you are, like your, your background, your upbringing, that kind of thing. Right. My background is not very, well, kind of interesting and not at the same time, because um, um, uh, I, when it comes to religious background and my struggle with religion or faith, it was completely um, uh, um, uneventful in a way, because I was born into a family uh, of non-practicing Muslim and Christians at the same time, an Egyptian mother, sorry, Egyptian father and Irish mother. And um, uh, uh, even though we were brought up um, sort of freedom of religion, old books of uh, all faiths and philosophies and psychologies and all sort of things were readily available at home. So I could make a choice if I wanted to, to practice a religion or not. Uh, so it was, it was never a struggle for me. So I don't have a, a traumatic experience with religion. And that's why I think it's reflected. Uh, I don't have the anger that a lot of people, and rightly so, you know, I, I don't want to be a judge here because I could be uh, uh, playing it cool uh, in, and uh, not feeling what people have to endure uh, to exit religion. So I, I, I can't judge uh, those extreme uh, stories. But what I'm arguing against is whatever you do, do not stay in that trauma for, for a very long time because when you begrudge a situation, you're actually uh, imprisoning yourself. You need to free yourself at some, for, for, at some stage and become who you're supposed to be. Living in anger and uh, frustrations and uh, uh, animosity uh, with a certain idea, even though you've departed long ago, um, it could be quite um, sort of um, hindering, uh, if you wish. I think you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, the uh, sirens out here are crazy today. Um, so yeah, sorry, I was gonna say, I didn't know if I should actually bring that up, but that, that's the sense that I get. I think that's why I find it so enjoyable to, to listen to your conversations because it, you know, you come from it from such a kind of like pragmatic, rational, almost a stoic approach. And you can see that, you can see obviously people who, you know, need to speak out against religion or dogma of a certain kind because it's almost cathartic in a way for them to almost deal with their, their trauma from that religion. Uh, so it almost becomes like a sense of purpose. But again, these topics are so heavy and they're so um, sensitive, especially Islam, right? That's the one where we really, really get like, oh, should I be saying this? Um, so I completely agree with you. There's different approaches that appeal to certain people. And, you know, when people haven't clear, because we understand how how traumatic religion can be on the psyche, on somebody's life, on all of that. But you're right, it definitely comes across in, in the approach that you use to, to handle these conversations and say things. So again, the distinction is so important to whenever speaking about Islam, like this is, okay, Islam maybe ruined my life in X, Y, and Z way, but that has no bearing on Muslims or the people around me that are following this ideology, whether out of ignorance or because they're born into it or because they're happy to stay cultural Muslims. Um, so that de- genuinely comes across in your approach and I feel like um, I'm very much in that camp as well I want to come from it to from a very almost I, I borderline want it to be light-hearted at times you know these are just conversations that are happening yes. we're not here to like f- change your mind in an instant but just hear what we have to say and go go back and do your homework and and you're everyone is on their own journey so like I, I definitely see that in your approach and I really really do commend that um, and also just as a side note for anybody watching if you do feel that like traumatic a residue of religion, which is very much a real thing. That's why there's programs out there like Recovering from Religion, um, who actually also go into the like, nitty gritty of how it affects your psyche. But even with me, for example, the way that Islam nearly kind of took away my liberty based on Sharia law, that was a whole process that I had to like work through. And as Hani said, there might have been some, there was some heavy like trauma there. I don't know if I fully attributed it to Islam, but again, that was something that I did, like I went and I worked through and boom, it's like, it's all gone. And you're like, you know how you are, Hani, when you touch the black stone in the Kaaba and your new, newborn baby, sometimes therapy <laughs> does that to you in a much better way. 
it's it's you know people you know and that's why you can't really judge because um i see the material available right now on youtube is it, it, it varies some people need that first shock um you know and and the shocking material is important because you it might be it might sound that i'm arguing against the unsophisticated approach to critique in islam but that's mm. not true uh the shock needs to be there because there's some people cannot be uh, the, the cast can uh, the, or the spell cannot be lifted um, unless you shock them firsthand. But just like primary school, you, you, you got to learn the alphabets before you start to learn about quantum mechanics. And I think I come later on. It's like, what then you do with yourself? OK, you lift religion. So what? What then? And, and this is where I come in. So, okay, well, you left religion. This is where we can fill in the gaps, you know, because the, there are lots of gaps that will be left open, like, you know, um, uh, the, the numinous or the, the awe or the, the feeling of spirituality. What is spirituality? Can we have spirituality without supernaturals and things like that? So uh, this is where I come. And an old sort of education uh, is required, and none of them is superior. You, you, don't, you, can't, you don't come to quantum mechanics before you learn how to read and write. So that's how I see it, and it's very important. Yeah, and I think that's why I, I resonated so much with your channel, because as you're saying, it is for people. Genuinely, it's aimed at those conversations that you're willing to have beyond the scope of religion. And when you've kind of you've gone past all of that, like, oh, but what's subjective morality and what's subjective morality and all of those kind of arguments and the Kalam argument. And, you know, you've been there, you've explored all those ideas and you're like, no, OK, not for me. I'm, I'm, I'm confident in my position that Islam or any kind of religion is not the truth. Where do I go from here? And you, your exploration of ideas is just so nice because these are the conversations that I'm I'm striving to understand which is why I'm saying don't know if I'm even ready to have them at the level you have because you've like absorbed so much now my like the purpose of this channel is more keep the focus on Islam keep the focus on Islam but personally I'm at the level where I'm listening to conversations that you're kind of having and I'm like this is the intellectual stimulation that is like required once you have dealt with all of that and you can confidently say right i'm not i'm not here to sit and debate with muslims and change all their minds i'm on my own journey and i'm here but we have to remember how dangerous islam is so that's why i'm yes. really glad i think this conversation we're having is 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 good because it almost like bridges both of those sides of, of the fence if that makes sense so honey i think you were extremely lucky <laughs> might i say in not having um kind of religion imposed on you or shoved mm -hmm. down your throat in that way as as a child growing up um, so just in your like young mind, when you have exposure to both of these religions, where were you, were you like, let me holistically take on both of these as my identity, or were you kind of veering towards one more than the other, or how do you balance the Christian element and the Islamic element at home? Yeah, so a lot of people are asking in, in, in the, the chats, I'll, I'll skip to the very end and I'll backtrack a bit, so I'm an atheist right now. Um, mm -hmm. um, so I'm an atheist, but I'm not a dogmatic atheist. So uh, I, I can't live there. I can't prove there is no God. Uh, definitely, the Abrahamic God ca cannot exist because he defies the, the one of the first laws of logic, which is the law of um, well, uh, the law of non-contradiction. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he's the married bachelor to me. He cannot exist. Um, <laughs> he, yeah, for me, it's just illogical um, and uh, inconsistent with with logic. However, there could be different types of, not gods then at that point, but more, more like creators, and whether they're conscious or not. That's a, a, a different type of debate, some like, something like the, the god of Spinoza, uh, who Einstein adopted at some point, who is not a god. You know, he's, he's not an, it's a non-agency. It's, it's more of the, the pantheist um, approach to, um, holistic approach that we are part of a canvas and the canvas sort of encompasses everything and we're part of everything. So that might be sort of something that we can be considering, but I don't need to really live my life as if God exists, because if he's out there open to having a relationship with him uh, or with me, he, he would know exactly the, 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 the key to my personality, what can would convince me of his existence. So I don't really need to do much um, other than just navigating life, searching for truth, no matter where it is. And it doesn't have to be just who started it all. There are so many uh, things in life that you want to explore from physics to chemistry to biogenesis to biology to so much going on here that we need to explore. And sometimes God gets in the way uh, and, and, and narrows down your your worldview and window to, to look at the world. Once you free yourself from that 
um, imprisonment, you realize there's so much to to um, to wonder about, and there's so much to 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 think about. So, my dad was a, an atheist, even though he was a, a, a Muslim, born Muslim. Uh, my mother was kind of well, born Catholic, but more like deistic spiritual non-practicing christian um and uh the books were all my, my dad loved philosophy so much uh and we had all sort of books around psychology philosophy growing up and i took in religion as uh, as a point of challenge at some point you know a teenager so even though you, you love your your parents but you want to challenge them a bit and mm -hmm. one of the one of the best way to challenge them is, is to take the other approach to 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 what they think thinking that are, this is you're really pushing them around here so i actually became uh, 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 I, I read christianity and um uh, islam and i wanted to take islam on for for a journey take it for a test drive <laughs> yeah yeah and i returned the car within uh, two years <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would say drive right back to the showroom, honey, but two years is not bad at all. Well, okay, so, so please, can, can you, uh, I, I'm really excited. How did this test drive go? Well, it, because, because sort of I was exposed to all different ideas. As soon as I started reading, my eyebrows were just going up and down all the time reading. So, so many different, and I could obviously read in Arabic. So I'm a native Arabic speaker too. Mm -hmm. um, so I can read and I can understand. And I, love linguistics i can speak read and write seven languages so I'm, i've got a brain that is sort of wired up for uh, words and and the meaning wow, behind honey, a certain you're a polyglot that's amazing how many uh, yeah, languages well, my, do you my, speak uh, i speak german spanish italian french uh, i uh, <laughs> hebrew a bit of i take i take on languages as, as, as i sort of move on in life I, I love languages i think they carry a lot of what we think because they the word uh, carries more than just the meaning of the word it's uh once you put it in a certain construction it takes a, a different life form so i think words are very interesting also a hundred percent and sorry to inter interrupt there but also don't you agree that when because i'm the same I, i'm fascinated by languages and I, I, my aim is to be where you are um i'm not there yet i've probably got like th four under my belt but um you know when you when you learn a different language like for example like even when when you're speaking in french the 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 phrasing of the sentence or what they're saying actually like and like it puts a new thought into your mind to actually see the world differently because the way they're yes. constructing their sentence is linked to how they are seeing the world and the same thing with Arabic right so you're almost like you're introducing new thoughts and ways of thinking and observing the world through learning that language which I find so crazy language is a reflection of the thoughts on the culture of a country there are some languages don't have future tense I think it might mm -hmm. be Finnish um, uh, and, and it has a reflection of what the culture sort of encapsulates. So it's quite interesting. There are some languages are very, Arabic is very poetic. And that's why yeah. you find the Quran and the challenge issued by the, the God of the, the Quran, Allah, is quite an, an interesting one because it's, it's posing a challenge about something that's quite subjective. Uh, is like uh, yes exactly the uh, Shakespearean uh, uh, play can you can you do better it's like what what do you mean by better that's like yeah. it's a subjective thing um uh, you know, Iliad you too who who's judging this how you what's the criteria exactly. uh, what are the parameters how do you judge this one is one or, or this one but you can judge it by saying oh well, you know the, the scientific claims in the Quran are actually incorrect they can be verified as not to be true and therefore it, it is not a perfect um, um text uh, by any stretch of the imagination it's, it's funny when something so like cont like at the actual content and contextually it's so poor yet it, it asks for this subjective challenge <laughs> to the world it's and crazy. it's like really you don't have a leg to stand on i um, think the posing the sorry i'm going to say something in very quick in 30 seconds i think posing the challenge to start with shows how um uh, uh, uh sort of human made the religion is i mean uh, for a for a for an all-powerful being to take on humanity is such a it's such a an immature move. It's almost like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime, uh, you know, stepping into a bar and uh, shoulder budge a, a toddler and say, "Well, are you, are you challenging me? Let's go for an arm rest." I was like, "Come on." Yes, ex that's exactly what I was just thinking. I was like, the, the creator, the lord of the lords, the lord of the worlds is challenging his own creation. Like, what? 
It's crazy. Absolutely makes no sense. And the fact that people still think this is like a, a, a verified challenge that still exists and it's not been like, you know, it's it's still not been surpassed or accepted. It just blows but my you know, mind. We know that in our crowd. If you have a crowd of friends and there's that one friend is always looking for a challenge, doesn't that hide a bit of insecurity? I was just going to say, there's some insecurity behind that, that's for sure. And then imagine that, honey, if you lump that in with, don't ask too many questions because these things aren't for you to know. Or like, if you ask too many questions, you'll apostatize. So don't like, there's Crazy. so many issues wrapped up in that. Clearly, you're not who you say you are. Um, so just coming back to your, your situation a bit. So there's a young honey kind of wanting to be a bit rebellious and not like, you know, adhere to any side in particular, but then you're like, let me take Islam for this test drive. You speak Arabic, you can read the Quran like verbatim face value. And um, is that just your young mind reading the contents? Did you have issues with it the very first time you started reading it or was it kind of a slow burner? No, straight away. I remember reading some verses that I think was the cow, um, you know, the, you know, al <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> And some of the, the, the stuff was just, you know, that when God was intending to create uh, humanity and, and the angels sort of saying, you know, hold on a second, God, are you sure? <laughs> like, yeah. like, cool it down, folks, I know what I'm doing. You know, it's, like, <laughs> yeah. and it's so funny. It just sounded like it's like I was trying to imagine the scene in my head. And I thought it was quite, are these beings, I thought angels were made to, to obey. And yeah. why are they suddenly sort of uh, veto the, the 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 judgment of God? So it was was like weird. And then they Satan seem to God. be shareholders in this board meeting, don't they? Like, <laughs> yeah. And and then I remember Satan's um, uh, position, and I thought, you know what? This is a dude of principles. You know, he's actually yeah. he's got some. And it's like, oh, kudos. I mean, that guy is actually a stand-up guy. He knows what the hell is going to happen to him. He's he's going to fry forever, and, and, but he is willing to stand up for his own, uh, sorry, you could call it wrong, but his own judgment and stand by it. Uh, and I thought that was quite noble. He, was, <laughs> he wasn't a backstabber. Uh, uh, mind you, God has done a lot of backstabbing, you know, the the the, the what he the way he buggered around with Job, uh, yeah. along with, 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 with Lucifer again, the morning star. In Judaism, Satan had a completely different role to play. He wasn't mm -hmm. Satan of the Quran. Satan of the um, uh, of the of the New Testament is completely different, and by the way, Judaism started with no concept of uh, heaven or hell, no concept of afterlife, and Satan wasn't even there. He was called the adversary, and that was the very very final writings of the um, of the Old Testament. So he didn't enter the scene until way later, and a completely different. Wow. Wow. So is that because I've heard the same thing about hell, like that, that as a concept was brought in later. But so in the Old Testament, do we not find any reference to hell per se? Or like definitely nothing like the Islamic it's, hell? It's called in, in, in Hebrew, it's called Gehenna. Gehenna, uh, okay, which is where we get Jahannam from in Arabic, right? Correct, yeah. yeah. And Gehenna is, is actually, and, and I spoke to Bart Ehrman and we talked about this. So we, I have an episode with Bart Ehrman uh, and we talked about Gehenna. And Gehenna is, is, the, is, is a pit where you throw uh, criminals' uh, bodies after they've been executed. So whenever there is a reference to Gahana, it actually means oblivion, not wow. a, 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 a torture after after death. Um, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the, the Jews believe that, that once they're, they're, they're dead, they're dead. That's, that's it. But mm -hmm. then later on, later writings have developed the idea of eternal life later on in a, in a slightly different concept. But there's a very interesting... Uh, debates with, with, with Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, and two Jewish rabbis. And yeah. actually, I love this uh, debate. It's because it was so lighthearted. Uh, the yeah. Jews are brilliant. I mean, especially they're, they're so naturally atheistic, even rabbis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you often find that. <laughs> that's uh, So the conversation was so much fun for me. But uh, so sorry, Christian honey, means. just to do yeah. they acknowledge? So do the rabbis acknowledge that yeah. Gehenna was this? Okay, wow. Yeah, there the, 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 the was no, that concept wasn't there. And they were trying to uh, sell you the concept of, uh, uh, 
of a figure of speech and a sort of an emotional hand. It's not like a real fire type of thing. And it, 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 they're trying to take the conversation into sort of a, a spiritual realm that Christopher Hitchens stopped them right on their track and said, <laughs> uh, now, are you telling me that that God that you are telling, Yahuwah, who is a God of war, by the way, uh, God, yeah. uh, he descended from El, and mm -hmm. he was a small God uh, that was sort of uh, given a promotion to look after the Israelites, and he was a God of war. That's how he started. Uh, literally, he was a God of war. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting you say that. Um, also, I love those Hitchens and, and like the tag team debates. So I'm definitely going to ask for the link for that one. I have to see this. I thought I'd seen them all, but clearly not. Um, but that's so I also like I'm really keen to know now what like actual the, the, the lay Jew believes would happen after death. But just hold that thought for a second, because so I, I've been doing some um, like like just a deep dive into historical Islam and like the more kind of South Arabian um, impact the paganism, the Gnostic Christianity, like the, the Gnostic Christianity, like the text from Christianity and the Gnostics when Christianity was kind of like veering off into different trajectories and everybody was calling each other heretics. But so when Muhammad came around, obviously like one of the first gods as well that he had attributed um, like his cult, let's say, for lack of a better word too, was actually based on, as you said, that the, the, the the subordinate almost of El, which was the god of war. And that's why like war was so inherently built into uh, like the general, like, you know, expansion of, of this cult. And it was like kind of, um, war was really, let's say, um, what's the word? What's the opposite of vilified? It was <laughs> encouraged and, and like, um, what's the word? I can't think of it right now. But anyway, so yeah, so I see that. And, and you can tell when you look into any of these religions, whether it's Judaism, you see how this pantheon of gods kind of relays and then they all choose their one and then it becomes really localized. And even with the Islamic concept of, of Jah Jahannam or hell, you can see where that direct link could have come from that pit of Gehenna. And over time, obviously, you've got Judaism playing out, you've got Christianity playing out, then you've got Islam coming onto the scene. And they have taken this concept of this pit with the the dead corpses and the horrific smells and whatever you know everything bad and dark and and horrible associated with that and that's like blown out of proportion into the islamic hell where you're going to be roasted over and over again and be like mm. hung with iron rods and 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 to the point where honey i was w watching a stream yesterday it actually says for the jews and the christians even after the day of judgment, like when God is, you know, weighing up your sins, he is actually going to trick the Jews and Christians when they ask for water. He's going to say, you've got permission to go and have water. And they will oh, unknowingly walk into the pits of hell. <laughs> and you're like, even then, God is the best of de the deceivers, even yeah. after this. Like, you really true. You're very on brand there. Yeah. Um, uh, so, some Muslims uh, don't like the word deceivers. They say, no, no, hold on a second. It's a, a schemer. So huge difference. Huge difference. <laughs> because that's so much better, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, so, okay, so Islam, so you started reading it and then were you just, did you voice your, like, did you just keep that to yourself? So that like, you know what? I started to say something, yeah, something isn't right. You know, that the, the text will, will contain so many issues for me. And remember, I was at the age here of I'm talking about maybe 15 when mm -hmm. I started do that i left islam by the age of 17 um and, and christianity at the same time because I, I was never convinced with christianity i read more about christianity growing up than islam uh because it, it was to me it was more the the more interesting philosophically out of the two uh islam is pretty blunt and straightforward like judaism uh christianity is a little bit more sophisticated because it's a it, it comes out of a hellenistic culture so there's a lot of tragedy and drama and the romans and the greeks there's a bit uh, but when we compare the israelites and the arabs we're talking about nomadic tribes uh so these were not very when, when i say uncivilized i don't mean here something horrible but the, the word civilization is uh, defined as um, uh, people who have stable 
abode and where they can sit um, in, in that particular area and issue rules and, 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 and issue a culture and civilization. That's why the Egyptians or the Chinese or the Indians would be considered civilizations rather than a, a nomadic tribe. Just by the virtue of moving around doesn't give you the chance to settle down and, 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 and start civilization. So in that sense, they were very similar. Uh, they were um, uh, shepherds and, and, and simple people. Uh, so therefore, uh, the, the, their thoughts and their uh, reflections are very, are very primitive. Uh, while in Christianity, it's a little more, more developed and still cuckoo, you know, to me, but the more interesting kind of cuckoo. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like I wish uh, just for like intellectual stimulation purposes and, and a bit more like, you know, drama and, and actual stories that have more depth to them. I think the Bible would be a much more fascinating read than sitting there memorizing the Quran half your childhood. You know what I mean? Wow. Um, also, the fact that it's so like readily available in English. And as you said, because of the Hellenistic um like culture that it stems out of you are combining all of these elements which are more fascinating and and the thoughts and myths that were you know even further beyond in time and then you just see islam's horrible like bastardization of those myths but not even in a full way so when i when i found bits of the quran that actually really intrigued me um trying to put together like ancient history so like the bits that talk about king solomon or or bilkis supposedly the queen of sheba i was yeah. like tell like this is interesting and the quran is like oh yeah the queen of sheba this kill the unbelievers wherever you find them i'm like just stick to the story just one minute please yeah, give me, give me the mother of dragons type of sort of storyline, so I can get interested a bit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, if you look behind me in the background here, I'm, I'm I'm fascinated by sort of the archetype, the Jungian arch archetype, and and superheroes. So all these superheroes yeah. behind me, uh, some of them are actually purchased from Doctor Robert Price because we, oh, we share wow. the same fascination. But you know, yeah. Superman is Jesus. So Superman is allegory of Jesus. Uh, it, it's got it's, <laughs> yeah okay yeah the 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 man of steel you know where he sort of uh, um, get to show his his powers at the age of thirty only his dad tells him not to reveal himself because the world is not ready for him that's Kevin Costner and that <laughs> thing before he was taken by the tornado um, uh, he, he got killed and he was resurrected, you know, in that, in that recent edition of the movie. So Superman is Jesus. So Jesus yeah. makes more of an interesting Jungian archetype. It's more fascinating, you know, the, the, the warrior that sort of redemptions and stuff like that. It's a complex story. While in Islam, it's um, maybe a bit, I'm a little bit too harsh here, but uh, I find it sort of sort of bland and, and, and there isn't too much interesting going on. Um, so after about the first year, I've come to realize that something is dodgy. It's just something dodgy. And maybe I put it down to my young age and, and I started engaging some imams and sheikhs and mosques. Uh, and the mm -hmm. answers were not answers. We're like, what the hell you're doing here? You know, you're not supposed to be thinking about these things. Or given really, really, really low IQ answers. Um, I, I was born in a, in a, in a house that... Uh, household we read read quite a lot so i think at the age of 16 i've already bypassed the uh, the the your regular imam in terms of checking the world outside and these were people who are just their only knowledge uh, was contained within um, the quranic text and i was i've already sort of um passed that point so at and, that and point honey, the science of hadith <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Especially that one with the fly, you know, if one fly fills in someone's milk, you know, you gotta dip the other wing because it has the a the other one cancels so, it out. <laughs> you just can you believe I mean imagine I'm just thinking of that scene of four people sitting down having a drink and you know all the flies are running around, they keep dinking their, you know, instead of putting a, a biscuit in their tea, they're putting flies in their tea. Oh my gosh. And can you imagine they're like, right, we have to like summon a meeting. This is really important things we've got to discuss about the world. Can you kiss your wife during your fast? Let's have a like, let's have papers and papers on this and the rulings. Like, really, how are you gonna get anywhere in life, like actually in reality, when these are the matters that you're you're dealing with and care about to this extent? And the funny thing is, people are submitting scientific papers these days, you know, like the, the, the benefits of drinking camel's urine. 
and you read, you go into a scientific, go to Google Scholar, you'll find somebody with an abstract and trying to cite some science, and you just, people are gone cuckoo, like bananas. I mean, you're, you're, are you serious? You are, are writing a scientific paper about the, the, the benefits of drinking the camel's urine in the 21st century. It's wild. It's wild that people are still like they have enough resolve to try and defend these things and still stand by them. Because, you know, it's easy for people like you and I, when we like read or we think about it and we're like, you know what? No, like not for me. I can't defend this. I, I can't. And you just step. So but it's harder to stay there and be like, oh, yeah, well, let me try and defend like a six year old marriage in 2022 when everything about society and our fundamental laws tell us that is wrong. Um, do you know what I mean? Like everything biologically, whatever. But you, again, you have papers. I think Yakin Institute issued a whole paper um, on Aisha's marriage. And you're like, they're still trying to do this. You see, on Aisha's marriage, I've got a slightly different angle here because mm -hmm. I would not use it against Muhammad as such. Mm -hmm. I'd use it against Allah because Muhammad, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, they were engaged at the age of six and the, the marriage was consummated at the age of nine. Still a child, mm -hmm. uh, but but these sort of things used to happen at that time. This is, this is a time, remember, this is a time where the average age, uh, uh, life expectancy, probably around 40, 45. So mm -hmm. you ought to start your life a little early. Imagine in, in today's society where you get married at the age of 30 or 35 and you get married. It's like, oh, by the way, you've got only 10 years to go before we finish it all. So people mm -hmm. used to start a bit early, but we're talking early couples, you know, like, you know, young, you know, uh, 52 years old and, and nine years old is, is disgusting. Yeah, but, old uh, enough to be her grandfather, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. that's horrible for, for sure. But I would have expected God you know, he's talking to God. This is the time where God is sending messages to humanity. You would think at that point, that's, uh, hold on a second here. Uh, this is a practice that is not very uh, good for humanity. Uh, uh, we hereby would like you to abolish. You're going to be the first one to say this sort of thing is wrong because yeah. the age of consent has not been reached. And this would have been a marker of maybe somebody is definitely divinely talking to Muhammad, but it didn't happen. He did exactly what people used to do at the same time. So therefore, I will not judge him morally by today's standard, but I will just say he's just a man. Mm -hmm. I agree with you in the sense that he was definitely a product of his time. And, and that was the thing back in the day, even in, in various cultures, we see that. Um, again, I agree with you in the sense that the fact that Allah himself could be bothered to like abolish like gambling and, and interest and usury yeah. and, and, you know, alcohol, but he doesn't care about this flies in the face of him being like all knowing and omniscient anyway. So you already that's cast a doubt on Allah. Could he not foresee this when clearly he's apparently since the beginning of time foresaw that Abu Lahab should burn in hell. So you're like, well, you know, well, where is God's head at? Um, but second of all, I would extend my like contempt for God to Muhammad in this case, because the amount of times the Quran says, like, obey Allah and follow the sunnah of the prophet. And sometimes the Quran actually says, like, obey and follow me. So you're like, oh, who's really writing this? But um, the fact that, you know, Muhammad ha like has, he's been like, embedded in history and especially in the Islamic psyche as the perfect moral example for mankind. Therefore, any act that he does, I mean, the Muslim, a Muslim man, um, but any Muslim in general, but a Muslim man should technically be walking like Muhammad, eating like Muhammad, sleeping like Muhammad, brushing his teeth like Muhammad, wiping his bum like Muhammad. Do you know what I mean? Everything is there. This is the perfect man. So one of his actions like that, uh, yeah, for sure, God is, is completely the, the, the Allah is if you employ proper epistemology, we only mm -hmm. know about Muhammad is what people told us uh, that they know about Muhammad. We don't know if he actually did any of that sort of thing. You know, uh, what if he did things differently? And people who uh, took them, I mean, remember, um, Sunnah and, and, and Hadith were written some 200 years ago in Bukhara, where Bukhari is. He's a non-Arab. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, we're talking about outside of Arabia, 200 years after the event. How the hell did he know how Muhammad used to wipe his bone? I mean, how would he know? How would you know that piece of information? And, and even then, Hani, apparently the information that he came across and he was given was like in the hundreds of thousands. He discarded over what, like how many hadiths? But I think over like 70%, he just chucked away. And the ones that he kept is what and we have today. Mathematically uh, impossible. I think he sort of handled like 300,000 hadith. 
If you yeah. count uh, how many hadith he can do, it's actually mathematically impossible for him to do in a lifetime. So wow. I've done the calculations, it's impossible. So <laughs> the, the amount of exaggerations where people are have superhuman uh, strength and, and capacities are, are all over the ancient world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and as you said, the, Muhammad was not around to even verify what's in the Hadith. He wasn't even really around to verify the Quran. So, yeah, as, yeah. yeah it could all be construed as complete hearsay. Um, so when obviously you'd kind of in your head done away with Islam, you're like, these answers are not sufficient. And honestly, like I'm cleverer than these imams that I'm turning to. Um, also, I really want to say mad respect to your parents for being so well read and educated. And I really feel like you know, just as a parent, if you have a bookshelf at home with a broad range of topics and you're having these discussions, your children are going to naturally be inquisitive and not so dogmatic. So in, in the same way, exactly when I was growing up, I know my parents are also quite like level headed and relaxed. They're kind of, you know, born and brought up in the UK. So it's not that strict principle. They were also kind of looking for, you know, more answers and more of an understanding. So they had a wide range of books on like Sufism and all of this kind of stuff. And then my dad's got all the philosophers again same thing as you like it just encouraged that he was you know obsessed with Marcus Aurelius's meditations and um just like Socrates Plato Aristotle what did they all have to say so we they were fine they were like on a journey within Sufism and that's where I kind of touched base there and I was like oh but as you said Islam you touched on it earlier is not even as well, fun or enjoyable or intellectually stimulating, but also not as spiritually like deep as maybe things that you could extract from the Bible. So I found Islam very bland, as you rightly said, like it's very much do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, this fear, guilt, fear, guilt, don't do everything fun is forbidden. So you're like, what is this like dreary existence that I have? So to make, you know, t for me to try and make, um, like sense of this existence and kind of give it that purpose when you feel that existentialism creep in from Islam mm -hmm. and also you're in in a psyche and everything every cell in my body was telling me if a god exists he really should be more like just chilled out than this one like why do you care if I went out or not or did this or not like surely you've got bigger fish to fry you know so I I was like Muslim in my heart fully but in my head I was saying oh god is love and love is god and kind of mixing up all these different things and you know reading Osho as well and like trying to come to this thing where it is Allah but Allah is not this hateful vengeful Allah of like the Torah or the Quran and like maybe he's a bit more like Jesus who knows like golden rule let's just go with that so did you how did you feel then when you kind of looked into the the Christian side of things and that push you did the did leaving Islam kind of or saying this is not right push you more towards the the Christian side of things yeah so I've sort of adopted um uh, at this point uh, um a strategy of uh, you don't need to drink the entire ocean to know it's salty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I've, I've the gulf is enough. <laughs> yeah, so I, I went straight to God then. I, I wasn't going to try to take another religion to see. Maybe I stumble upon one of those thousands of religion. Maybe one is, is true, so I'll have to go through a series of them. So I went straight to the to the source. Is there a God? And and this is where this is where it gets really interesting. Once you remove all the stupid texts. Um, and you go into things like the argument from contingency, uh, the logical uh, necessities, um, uh, things like the Kalam cosmological argument, things like cosmology and biology and understand uh, biogenesis and uh, could, could things have evolved the way uh, the, uh, the theory of evolution has told us. And, and, and once you open your mind to all these things and engaging God directly, uh, the creator, is there a creator to... To this world because it might be a complete slightly different agenda or a completely different agenda than what's marketed in in religions so I've, I've started to engage god immediately probably at the age of 18 and i got very interested in philosophy so my first degree uh uh it was uh, in egypt and i graduated from a university of uh, languages this is how i got to to learn my languages um nice. uh, then i took on philosophy I talk about first psychology in Ireland and then philosophy in, in New Zealand. Um, and, 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 and these were topics that I wanted to learn about. Nothing to do with jobs or career whatsoever. So my job has nothing to do with most of my educations that I've done throughout my life. My last master, so I do have two master degrees. One is in philosophy. 
I do nothing with philosophy. I've got postgraduate from um, uh, uh, University of Cork in, in, in psychology. It's nothing to do with my career. My latest um, master is to do with my career. It's just an MBA to, to further my um, professional career. Um, but the other two educations that I've obtained, uh, it was to, to me searching for uh, the truth. And it's to me, it was not in mm -hmm. books written by man. It was, I wanted to probe science because this is objective. It's harsh. It's hard. Uh, it, it cannot be twisted. And uh, I thought maybe I can find like uh, Stephen Hawking, when he wrote in the very last sentence in the brief history of time, so we can know the mind of God. Uh, and yes. he didn't know God because uh, Hawking is an atheist, but he meant once you understand the fundamental laws of physics and the one superpower that um, sort of got separated into four power uh, uh, that we dominate the physics today, maybe we can understand the, 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 the creation uh, power type of thing. And, and then we can be gods ourselves. But he was, again, misunderstood. And you get that quite a lot in the Arabic um, Facebook comments where uh, Einstein has been portrayed as religious because he said so uh, God doesn't play dice with the universe and he was talking about quantum mechanics and and uh, the Copenhagen interpretation <laughs> it was like it's completely yeah. something different but they've taken this as cues that they, oh, Stephen Hawking was a Muslim and Hanif as well <laughs> oh yeah I'm sure he was it was probably Wahhabi <laughs> before that as well you know and, and whatever inspiration he had throughout his life derived from the Quran <laughs> um but yeah even i remember there was um i think Rich, richard dawkins kind of tried to clear it up and, and quoted einstein one of his quotes and said this is like categoric proof that he did not mean god in the way that you all think it and people went nuts because they're trying to take these guys out of context all the time and kind of attribute something more to them just to obviously feel more comfortable in their position and also we have to remember that a lot of these um like insane discoveries and these these push these things that kind of push the frontier of science and human knowledge were at a time when it was still not really okay to just openly say no i don't believe in any of these gods that you talk about or proclaim so it was sensitive ground for uh, you know a lot of back in in the day in history um but it is good to be like oh so that's what i wanted to ask you actually so you, you, you've gone back to the notion of god now and you have like done degrees in philosophy and stuff. So you've obviously like, you know, really kind of tried to get to grips with some principles. And you mentioned uh, Spinoza's God earlier. So how much did that kind of resonate with you, if it did at all? Or did you, what, were you, what was your initial kind of thoughts of that? Well, to, to, be, to me, Spinoza is one of those people who you, who, um, uh, you would have mentioned in, in your conversation that maybe they weren't quite ready to reject God altogether. So these are the precur precursors to atheism then. Uh, you know, you, you can't completely mm -hmm. abandon God. Remember, epistemology hasn't been developed to the scientific method that we have today. It was still, we knew very little about the world around us. So I can completely understand that the first atheists, you know, uh, pe people like Laplace, when you go to Napoleon Bonaparte and He's, he's given him a, a book about the design of the universe. And Napoleon asked him, where is God in here? And he said, I don't need this hypothesis. And, wow. and, and things like that, ideas like that creeping in. This is Spinoza coming in, maybe to prepare the world for things to come. He said, no, I think that the, the God of the Bible is quite pity. That one who has a priority uh, to ban pork over um, uh, slavery. Slavery, yeah. Uh, it's, it's amazing. You know, like he's like he's completely, com you know, obsessed with uh, prawns or shrimps, and because that these things are banned in Hinduism. <laughs> yeah. So he's completely obsessed with prawns and shrimps. It's weird. It's very strange. He's, he, he obviously he's not on, on a seafood diet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, so funny. <laughs> you like, you like, yeah. What he does in the Bible, it, it says... What is it a says fussy eater, God, mate? <laughs> it says God loves that smell of burning flesh. He oh loves barbecue. Gosh. He loves barbecue. <laughs> he's, he's a kebab kind of dude. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's why he's gonna roast us like shish kebabs in hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe that's the sort of smell he'd enjoy. Yeah. Uh, but you know that's his priority. You know, mm. uh, and slavery took us humans to come up with that ah, slavery is not good for us. We need to start abolishing it. And uh, God never never occurred to God to to say that. Um, so uh, comes Spinoza in here, uh, preparing the world for for another type of God. One who is not pity, one who is not small-minded. He's actually not an agent at all. Is is that God does not have consciousness? He does not. He's not a personal God meddling into your affairs. You know, on the daily. Yeah, yeah. there's a movie that I'm going to um, uh, um, uh, recommend to you and to your audience. Yeah, uh, it's, it's called Mother by Jennifer Lawrence. Okay. Uh, and uh, Javier Bardem. Um, okay. It's called Mother with an exclamation mark at the end. Mm -hmm. And this is a biblical allegory. Anybody who saw this movie, they think it's a it's a horror movie, psychological horror, but it's not. It's hiding biblical references in it. And Javier Bourdain is God, is, is Yahweh. And and uh, uses Jennifer Lawrence is nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he keeps creating the universe. Hey, Hassan. Yeah, we have Hassan Radwan in the house. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here. Almost 20 years ago now. Or... <laughs> oh, wow. You guys go way back. Yes. How are mm -hmm. you, Habibi? He's written in Egyptian Arabic as well. Zayek Habibi. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the coolest people he can ever... I mean, he's brilliant. I love Hassan. He's a brilliant mind. Brilliant, brilliant mind. And honestly, even when I was trying to explore leaving Islam, Hassan Radwan, your videos I came across and they were just so resonating. Like they were so nice to hear the way you just dismantled hell and a vengeful God. Honestly, that that will never, ever leave my mind. So thank you so much. And, and all of that with, without being resentful or angry, you know, very, very cool. It's and he can understand. He can understand why people believe these sort of things so he's not he's not coming from an, a place of anger or resentment which is, is very important yeah it's really refreshing um, to see these kind that kind of approach to be honest especially again in in this doing what we're doing trying to put a, a spotlight on islam or dogma um marcus is also asking for the name of the film again i believe it was mother with an exclamation mother. mark is that correct yeah correct yeah i think it's 2017 very important movie i think so at the very end uh, so jennifer lawrence has got a heart of crystal and every time he creates the the narrative of the story and it completely collapses on on its sort of back uh jennifer lawrence sort of dies in a fire and he'll have to grab her heart which is made of that crystal Mm -hmm. and, and at the very end, she, she, she told him, why do you keep doing that? And he, it reminded me of the story from the, the crying game, the, the, the story about the scorpion and the frog trying to cross the, the, the river. And he mm -hmm. said, uh, I can't help it. It's in my nature. So it's almost like God's ontologies to create. He can't help but to create. And if that's the God of Spinoza we're talking about, this is not a conscious God. This is the, the, the creation energy itself. It's yeah. existence. Um, and if existence is eternal, if existence is eternal, um, then you don't need to have a beginning. It's always there. Nothing it's almost as if it could also play right into like the expansion of the universe, the way that it's, you know, it, it could just be that in the sense that there's creation and the universe is constantly expanding in that sense. If you take away consciousness from the creator itself, then all of the things we were talking about earlier in terms of holding Allah or God accountable for things that mere humans had to come and rectify because he wasn't able to foresee, that is clearly a God with either, I mean, you either have to say there's no conscience here or this is a true evil entity in the cases of the, the religions that we're talking about, you know, well, that expansion is, is bad news. It's um, it's it's uh, it's ushering the the heat death of the universe, the thermal death. <laughs> precisely. It's a precise, it's only gonna... end up, yeah, things are going to cool down and, and everything is going to collapse. But then that might be the beginning of something else because the Big Bang has been uh, talked about as as it's the beginning of our universe. But that's not necessarily true. Uh, it doesn't have to be the ultimate beginning. It might have been singularities could have happened throughout a bubble universe and and or a collapse or a or a big bounce type of universe where one universe collapses and the other one sort of begins um like a it's kind of an ouroboros the snake that is eating its tail type of infinity 
um, uh, situation here. So it's quite interesting. And that's why physics is very important to understand things like that. But you don't need God. See, you, with biology, the biogenesis, the, the, cause that's another area where um, intelligent designers come to refute evolution by saying, well, yeah, things are too complex. You could have not come up with the DNA. It's too complex already. Uh, I feel like, honey, don't you feel like that's such a cop out, though, because I'm like, just because you or whatever us, even as humans, I mean, a lot of the, the scientists in it, like top of their field, they know exactly what they're doing. And they have a lot of evidence to the contrary. But like, for example, so a lay person like me trying to understand this, just because I don't understand exactly how it's come about doesn't mean I automatically should just put God to fill in those gaps, right? The God of the gaps is so annoying because it's almost trying to say, yeah, my 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 mind is, to, and this is actually what Muslims say, like a caller yesterday on one of the streams was saying, our, our minds are too weak. We don't understand, like God has naturally like made our minds weak. And it's like, no, just because you don't have the answers or the intellectual capacity to understand the complexity behind it, you put a plaster on, you say, God is responsible for that complexity city you know and, and look it, clearly intelligent design so many things fly in the face of that we still have remnants of in our bodies that we don't need um Correct. it makes mm -hmm. no sense so yeah to, to, yeah go ahead it boils, it boils down to one thing it's 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 an argument from personal incredulity it's it's a appeal to ignorance it's, it's fallacious thinking but i'm going to be a bit um uh, merciful when it comes to religion because it wasn't all bad and i've got to be here impartial mm -hmm. and i'm going to say religion at some point and, and and uniting around an idea bigger than ourselves was helpful at some point remember this is a world where epistemology was which is basically when i when i talk about epistemology means our knowledge of the world outside of us or around us uh, we did not we have not developed enough tools to understand what was going on and one of the one of the ways uh, which is more of a platonic uh, a priori understanding of the world is somebody would say well these are the stories that we've inherited from our parents and if we stick together we stick with the story we'll survive and that helped uh, we have not evolved to know the truth we've evolved to survive and any idea even if it does not um, uh, uh, sort of matches reality uh, it might be good enough to help us survive because all what you need in a battle is to believe in something and that will give you that enough psychological energy to to, to fight through life. And I think yeah, religion did that at some point in the absence of the right tools to understand what's going on. But once we've developed, we've developed the proper tools, and I think the scientific method is the best tool to date that we've developed to understand to a degree the world around us uh, then religious becomes like that sort of uh, organ or that um a bit of human body that you no longer need like a tail or a, a wisdom tooth eventually uh, the body is going to reject it and it's, it, it, it is going to be removed in evolution so uh, just like bad or genes and uh, i think memes ideas go through natural selection as well it's just a matter of time yeah, I, I completely concur with what you're saying, to be honest. I, I do understand that, as you're saying, these more primitive societies, we needed uh, to believe in something bigger than ourselves. Again, that's so uh, psychologically, that's so motivating, whether you're, you know, going out to hunt for, for food or you're going to battle or you're trying to protect your family or you're, you know, it's, it's giving you some sense of comfort in that harsh world that we were faced with. But as you said, I do genuinely think that there comes a point in, I mean, I think we're still evolving, right? We're constantly oh, in, yeah. in the process of doing that and now as we've come to this point in human progression as Steven Pinker says I think we're living in the best times that humans have ever experienced on earth um, so trying to look at it from that optimistic lens I do think that it is it's high time we confront the fact that you know, religion is a, is a byproduct of our like evolutionary infancy. It is, it, it was something we needed back then, but as you said, it's a limb that now can just be amputated away. It's not, it's not necessary. Um, now, when you see people trying to make sense of the world we live in today in 2022 and be part of these diverse pluralistic societies, it's a, it's a lot harder to do that when a, a big chunk of that population genuinely believes in 
something that is so far from reality and it's so based in fable and myth um but again you know it, it it's people this is where i have a problem because um i completely agree with you and now i'm just like okay there's some people who will learn about you know religion and, and where it comes from like now because i've de delved into the like historical sides of islam as well i mean for me that it, it's crystal clear like the historical tapestry of like you know paganism and the religions that were knocking about then and then how all of this kind of evolved and all the abrahamic religions have kind of been you know meshed through time but you you see the history behind it for what it is you see humans trying to make sense of eclipses and make sense of these you know natural wonders that they're seeing or things like that you you see how they've become um like like these exaggerated myths have happened over times like how hercules would have happened um, and you just see that this is literally a part of like a culture shift in humanity and, and the progression of it. And now it's like, okay, do people read that and accept the truth for what it is and say, you know what, we don't need this to hell with all of this. We can just all be part of this kind of more progressive world based on the scientific method. And, you know, we can accept each other's beliefs. But do you not think that a lot of people still would not ever want to take that step because that human mm -hmm. psychological need for hope or comfort or this afterlife, this comfort blanket in the afterlife where you'll be reunited with your loved ones and your family is so strong and overbearing, even if they accept that like, okay, there's some things in Islam or whatever religion I don't agree with, but I want there to be a God. So uh, to answer this, I'm going to take you on a sort of a, a scientific journey. Sure. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the universe is 13.7 billion years old. Uh, the mm -hmm. Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Life emerged on Earth about 3.8 billion years ago. We live for about uh, 3 billion years with just bacteria and singular cell organism. Still yeah. no brain or no nervous system to be seen. You get the pre gamperian explosion or gamperian explosion situation, and you get the, the, the rise of oxygen, and, and then you get the, 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 the flourishing of, of, of different species coming about. And you get the precursor. Just the bubbling of, the, of life under the oceans, yeah. deep, deep at the bottom. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but but but, but the Precambrian. Now we're talking about almost like you know, uh, sort of full uh, body creature, and, and and we're talking about vertebrates now starting to be introduced. Mm -hmm. Backbone, and with the backbone, you, you get sort of a, a simple nervous system, and and what we call that, and the first precursor of the brain, we call it the ancient brain or the reptilian brain, which you still have. It's the back of the brain, that back bit of your brain. It's called the ancient brain or the reptilian brain. And that's why we you become unconscious when you get hit on. And th this is where your sex drive, your, your, your food, your all your primitive impulses that are good enough for you to survive. And we stay with that part, part of the brain for good 200 million years. Um, um, and, and then uh, the, the migration from cold-blooded animals to hot, warm-blooded animals and mammalians come on the scene and then you have the oxytocin and um, uh, all the hormones of the bonding between uh, uh, family members and, and this is where morality starts by the way this is where the moral compasses start because before that remember reptilians don't care for their offsprings mm -hmm. uh, some of them eat know, their own offspring yeah that or 500 eggs to lift on their own to fend from themselves but yeah a, a mammalian and and the mammalian with the, with the breast and the milk and the feeding uh, there are hormones flowing around between um uh, uh mother and son and and things like that so there is the, this is the first time where we're getting together um and then yeah, the mammary glands changed a lot yeah yeah middle part of the brain start to evolve and that's where emotions a lot of complex emotions a lot of groups dynamics families start to evolve so and that's for about 523 million years, right? Of ancient and middle brain. The, the, the frontal lobe cortex is only developed about two or three million years ago. This is where your cognitive and critical fun functions start to evolve. We are in the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of our logical journey. So I don't have a problem whatsoever why the vast majority of the world's population still display apish tendencies, because I'm not going to be harsh. We've lived with the ancient and the middle brain for quite some time. 
and uh, I'm going to cut humanity some slack, you know. Let that prefrontal lobe cortex uh, be in action for quite some time before we start judging people. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, we'll check back in another million years when <laughs> his life has been extended and he could be like, how's human progression going now? How's that brain uh, development? Well, if you, if you think of uh, belief, belief quantum mechanics and uh, there's something mm -hmm. called um, retrocausality where the future affects um, the past. <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's true, yeah. you know, in, in quantum mechanics, that's a lab because time is an illusion. Oh, wow. There's no such thing as time in physics. Time is a human construct because of the era of time. So yeah. time doesn't really exist in the way. So there could be a situation, uh, especially we live in a simulation universe. Uh, mm. One out of three, thirty-three percent, we live in a, a simulation, simulated uh, uh, universe where somebody's actually. Uh, telling you what to do and what to say uh, through a program. Uh, the matrix. Correct. Uh, you got to stay interesting, though, because you can be unplugged at any moment. So do crazy things every now and then, Noria. <laughs> I have no chance of being unplugged. Don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living it up. Um, but no, honey, that was really interesting because you know that what exactly the way you described it is, is I mean, when I was trying to wrap my head around it, you know that example they give of like a year when they describe like from the beginning of the universe to humans coming about and like it's it's condensed into a year just so our brains can understand that scale of time better because it is hard for us to grasp concepts as a lay human being, like concepts like infinity and you know, like all, all the stuff that you kind of go heavy into in your talks. That's why I find them so intriguing because you're trying to break, you're trying to make these concepts more accessible to people like us and try and wrap our head around this. But it, it's exactly as you said when somebody gave that year example i can't remember what it was but it was literally like um january is when the, you know the, the the big bang let's say happened or the, the, the that massive initial explosion and the world came into being but then the dinosaurs were here till about like september and it's like the verge of october november and humans have just we've just come so like that's like the scale of time. I somebody knows that full proper yearly example. It's really really a good way of understanding. I think Richard Dawkins does a, a brilliant job as well because he he talks about the arm length and he t talks about the human age is just a, a the file one file stroke of a nail, you know, and and and, and that would be the age of humanity, um, which is I, I find quite fascinating. But it's we're 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 very young. We're still very okay. young. Yeah, so so that makes sense, and and I understand then as well. Maybe I should I should cut people some <laughs> some slack. Um, no, because you are you are right. But um, so okay, following from that, then how? So do you? Okay, because I mean, now I'm thinking in the in the scale of the millions, right? Like this is a this is a grand evolutionary process that we just need to. Because obviously, our brains have started getting bigger. That the, the moment we developed like fire, and we didn't need to spend as much time chewing and have these bigger jaws. Like our brains were already getting bigger and bigger, and they were getting you know that we we're spending more time thinking about things, and we're 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 engaging those critical elements of our brain. We're not relying on those pleasure impulses anymore solely. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what do, I mean, do you have and I'm just going to follow Steven Pinker's line of thinking right now, as in it's just constantly getting better. Is that what you would also say? I don't know. Better, better is, is the right word here. Uh, it's different. It's getting finer because with, with, with advancement as well, you come, uh, you come across different type of issues. Um, uh, so, you know, with, with advancement, with technological advancement, you, you're facing some existentialist sort of um um, annihilation sort of ideas with n nuclear weapons and stuff like that. So it might not be all roses um, at this point, but it's definitely different. It's definitely a different type of challenge. We get, we're going to get to know more. And as, as we get to know more, we're going to have to take responsibility of our own actions. So um, maturity comes at a cost, you know, uh, once you face up to your challenges, life isn't easy. You know, that daddy in the sky that used to look after everything uh, it, it was. It's a comforting idea. It's a. It's a beautiful idea. But once you cut the umbilical cord, you've got to face up to your challenges as as, as a human, and that could be harsh for some people. Some people uh, might find it quite daunting and difficult to deal with. So, but um, definitely, it is going to be a different future for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. I, and I agree. So I. So. How did you then, because see, for some people, it just seems a lot easier, like when they, 
not easy. I mean, you know, you don't never know what somebody's actually experiencing inside or the internal conflict to kind of do away with the afterlife. I mean, I know for myself, like it was a bit of an existential crisis when the rug of Islam was pulled from beneath my feet and I had to reevaluate my entire like life and worldview and my reason for being and what's this all about and what's the point then if there's if you take Allah and heaven and hell out then what what's the point are we just all here like you know just time passing till we're dead um so you kind of have to go on your own personal journey and I just want to kind of know so obviously you didn't have this insane like you know like you were never taught that this is the one and only truth and you need to believe it. So you had a bit more like leeway, I'm guessing. You had like room mm -hmm. to, to play around and explore. But how was your transition from thinking, oh, okay, there might be a God and maybe, you know what, Spinoza's God is also like still like a possibility in terms of explaining possibly even just like, you know, the universe, but to come to the understanding that, no, you know what, I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist. I appreciate the scientific method more than any other thing that, you know, humans have come up with to date. Um, and the fact that you know now that th this life is your one and only life. Also, honey, can you just answer that question while I go and get the other charger? Because this one's not working and it's good. No, sure, for sure. Okay, for I'll sure. be right back. Uh, well, the the um, the idea of uh, the meaning of life is 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 going to be a futile one. Anybody who's going to engage in sort of the idea of um, the meaning of life is going to, it doesn't matter, even if you're religious. Uh, this is going to be a difficult one to crack because I don't think there, there is a, a meaning of life. Um, however, uh, you can maintain something similar to the meaning in life, which is things that you can or you deem to be important to you that you like to pursue to fill up um, or to fill in all the gaps and 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 and, and, and voids in your. Um, sorry, there is, there's a bit of background noise. Sorry, guys, I'm going to uh, maybe stop talking because I don't want to burst your ears. <laughs> so we'll take a moment of silence here. Or, okay, the echo has stopped. Um, so, yeah, a, a meaning in life is more likely the, 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 the type of line of thinking I'm pursuing at the moment where I've got oh, important silence. things. Hi, honey. Sorry. That's it should right. be okay now. Sorry about that. You were saying. So, so I, I was saying that you know, um, uh, the, the I've um, abandoned the meaning of life uh, type of sort of pursuit long time ago. There is no such thing. Uh, it's meaning in life. Yes. It, it's the stuff you deem important for you to achieve, and you. Uh, let's face it. Uh, once this is all done, and once we have all this large scale conversation about the cosmology and the human evolution you're still going to go back and say what's on Netflix tonight and I'm going to be, um, the English Premier League is about to be, well, the, it's been played at the moment, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a crazy for football type of dude. So I I'm going to watch. starting for you. I know, and I think Hassan is a Spurs fan and I am a Liverpool fan, so they, I think they're playing together tonight. Oh, what a game. <laughs> so, please, so please help us, Hassan. We, we want to win over the rich boys of Man City. <laughs> 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 oh my god um, okay well we won't keep you too long then because you've got your football matches to watch i know yeah my, my family are crazy about football as well and i think it's a big <laughs> <situation> <laughs> so uh you know so things in life you can fill up your life with bits and pieces that will keep you engaged that will give your life sort of a meaning but is there a plan from outside like somebody has planned and there's a plan for you top of Jesus Christ, God has a plan for you type of weird notion. Um, uh, the um, Yeah, I, I think it's it's very egotistic. I think the, the, the right thing to pursue is knowing that you've got certain um, uh, things you like in life, things, things you want to pursue. Um, you make an agenda for your life. You think, so I want to, like, you know, I know you're studying your master now, um, Nuria. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Fans. So you're Thank pursuing you. a career in law. You wanna, you wanna, you wanna probably push some sort of political agendas in, in um, which might be tricky in your line of business. But you will have a voice eventually to be able to be a bit more prominent in that area. So you've got some life goals, and we can fill up our lives with things like that to to enjoy the journey. Uh, uh, remember, we are witnessing our thoughts um, as, as they happen because thoughts are involuntary. Um, whatever you think you're thinking it's coming appearing in your mind without you realizing uh, you've already made up your mind or your conscious up, unconscious mind five 
half a second to five seconds prior to you thinking you made a decision. So free will is an illusion. So I might as well just enjoy the ride. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. See, honey, this is the problem. When I listen to you and I like hear your talks as well, I'm like, oh, like surely there must be something I really disagree with him on. <laughs> um, but I find myself like by and large agreeing with a lot of what you're saying. And I think that's why I really wanted to have this conversation because I think like what we've taken away from the journeys but also the way you understand and see life now as well like as you as you said earlier it comes through because you don't you don't come from a place of of vengeance and trauma you were actually just like let's just explore what's out there let's see let's hear every side let's just go on this journey and let's learn and as you said it's it's not so much the lack of meaning of life because now we there's no concept of an afterlife or divine justice i know a lot of people rely on divine justice to kind of settle any massive wrongdoings that have happened to them in on earth for example like a lot of muslims i know if they've been you know they weren't able to to marry the love of their life or they've had to compromise their life with somebody else or they've just been you know really knocked around hard by life they are waiting for this justice this divine justice they're going to get in the next life but in doing so what they do is kind of waste this life away just uh, you know not to sound like not to say they're wasting their time without saying they are wasting their time but, but it's almost like accepting victimhood this sort of mentality gets you to accept victimhood we we know that most of the atrocities have changed have committed by man and have been changed by man we mm -hmm. we have committed the things that we've changed so far god has never intervened in, in any of that we know that country i mean if we want to have a practical and uh, understanding of, of of laws and the repercussions con theocracy theocracies right now are having trouble in, with human rights, with, with standards of living and everything. Laws that run in most civilized countries now has nothing to do with divine command theory whatsoever. They are, they are hu humanly developed laws where we talk to each other and we come to an agreement of what's reasonable. And that will change with more knowledge and information as they evolve. Uh, if you have a stable or, or, or a fixed uh, type of uh, uh, rule of conduct uh, given to us from up above, uh, from God, for us to pursue, and it's fixed, uh, then you, how are you going to advance as humanity? And any country or any nation that sort of uses that sort of moral compass right now, they are failing big time as a, uh, as a civilization or as a culture, as a country, in all sort of human aspects. Those who are free themselves from uh, the intervention of God and develop laws that are reasonable based on science and debates and critical thinking are leaps ahead now. So if we want an example of, of, of this, it's right in front of us and it's quite evident to everyone. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and just to like, you know, piggyback off what you were saying, the problem with I honestly think this is contrary to like general human nature and progression, as we were talking about this constant evolution that we're we're still going through. Um if you take an ideology, and I'm going to just pin the focus on Islam again, because that's my experience. But if you take something like Islam, for example, and you're saying that we're going to keep getting better, right? Our laws are going to keep getting better. Our morality is going to keep getting better. Our understanding of the world is going to continuously improve. Then you've got something like the Quran or an ideology like Islam, which says we are going to take 7th century Arab desert Bedouin culture and enshrine it in this book and make you live in like literally that is you're shackled now to live with that that worldview and the morality of that time however detrimental that is for humanity but you're stuck you're almost frozen in time if you adhere yeah. to one of these ideologies which, which is another it. fallacious logical uh, you know thing it's called uh, appeal to antiquity there are mm -hmm. people out there they'll go oh they don't make them like that anymore you know, <laughs> yeah. you know that that sort of nostalgia that somehow we think the past is always better than today and and it comes with generations that i mean i've, I've started to feel it i've got that bias now because I, I was born in 1972. Yeah. so i belong to an era where uh i can you know you, you start watching netflix and you start watching uh, modern shows with 80s themes like the Stranger Things or, you know, things like that. And you have yeah. that sort of, oh, my God, the music were cooler. The rappers were a lot better. Uh, the lyrics were really good. And it's horrible today. So I've already started feeling it. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh no, I think it happens. You know, as you get older, you're like, oh, back in my day, it was so much. <laughs> uh, I'm always calling out my parents for doing that as well. And I'm like, it was terrible back then, admit it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so no, again, that that's, I think that's a massive problem. And I think, so a lot of people talking, talk about, okay, well, let's, um, let's reform Islam, or let's kind of take out the bad bits, and let's try and focus on the good bits. And I'm not sure that that's possible. Personally speaking, I don't, I, I don't think that that's a, a viable solution. But I just wanted to get your thoughts on what do you think about people who say that, like, oh, it's not all bad, you know, it teaches you to give charity and be good and be nice to orphans. No adoption, we know why, but <laughs> be nice and, to orphans. And we can do it without religion. I mean, we don't need God then. So if we can do that independent of the, of the divine idea, you don't need God to tell you that you need to be nice to orphans. You do it because this is human collaboration. I've argued morality can never, can never be based on divine command theory because that will make, uh, you know, the Euthyphro dilemma, the old dilemma between Socrates and Euthyphro when uh, the conversation, well, well, is it good because God says so or, or God it? says so because it's good? Yeah. And, and, and both ways, it's going to end up with morality being arbitrary, you know, and because God could say, do not kill, and five seconds later say kill, and that becomes good then because killing in that occasion becomes good because God com commands it to be that case. Um, so that will always fall on, on its face. Uh, morality is 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 um, uh, relative. It changes with time. It changes with, with information. We're developing morality around the Tesla model, uh, self-driven cars. Mm -hmm. There are people's ethical groups that are talking about, okay, in case of a collision, who should the car hit? The pregnant woman, the old man, or the child? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in a, in a trilemma. So the world isn't black and white. It's more like 50 shades of gray. It's it's the, the, the primitive thinking of the world of black and white, binary 0111001, it's, it's gone. Mm -hmm. If you're going to think about life properly, if you're going to think about situation, it's, a, it's always a spectrum. That's the only way you can think about life. Even Hani, with the um, with the mor morality around Tesla and things like that, that you were saying, even that when they're like, okay, but at the end of the day, this is a machine and this is AI. It's not going to think in the way that a human would. So if it was, for example, to see like a child and an old man, it may go and hit the child. But what would a human do? And they're having all of these like thought experiments and they're saying they're actually trying to mimic the morality of a human in that moment right. into the AI. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Correct. But again, well, yeah. The only problem is when the AI starts to override human uh, protocols and start to think on its own. This is another brilliant movie called Ex Machina, mm -hmm. uh, uh, where um, uh, uh, an AI finally become conscious. Uh, oh, wow. A human it's screwed called. as a result? <laughs> Fantastic. It's called Ex Machina. You've got to watch this. Is a, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of movies because they sometimes have uh, deliver very strong messages, the good ones in there. Um, in movies, yeah. but we can do that. Yeah, most definitely. And thank you so much for the other recommendation. The other recommendation, guys, if you weren't here before, was Mother with an exclamation mark. Um, Jennifer Lawrence was in that, yes. and that's that's a like a parable on a on a biblical tale. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, I don't yeah. want to ruin it because a lot of don't people really. don't see yeah. that. But your audience would be very privy to the Bible and the narrative. They they will catch on pretty quickly. Uh, my yeah. my wife is is born atheist. You see. So my wife was so never, yeah, but, <laughs> Born she free. Not, but she does not have the interests and person. Mm -hmm. She's like, she finds all of this is sort of waste of time. <laughs> like, you know what? Maybe, maybe that's the thing. Maybe if you come from the complete opposite, you find it so interesting because you are like, I was going down a completely different path for so long. My brain was actually wired differently. Like, honestly, honey, when you're believing in, in certain myths and things just because of this, like, belief element, I feel like when you come out of this, honestly, you neurologically change the way you, your brain thinks when you start enabling critical thinking and you start, like, you know, seeing seeing these issues. You're not, you're not like, for me, when I left Islam, everything went with it like my fear of hell fear of jinns all of this crap that i used to believe in is just like oh none of that is real i can just get on with life Remember, <laughs> you know i should uh, be more wary of burglars and muggers not jinns <laughs> epigenetics is a, is a thing even though we're born with some precursors to certain disposition but there are markers and genes where with interactions with the environment uh, um, outside they can be altered a little bit 
So yeah. uh, you, you, you can almost, almost steer yourself in a slightly different direction or use a natural tendency in a slightly different way. So let's say you are born with high adrenaline uh, situation or you know, you're, you're, you're born, born to violence, right? You could end up being a, a criminal or a thug or you can be um, uh, an army officer or a UFC fighter or uh, an Olympic champion for your country. So you can tame natural tendencies to choose a better uh, use for that particular uh, tendencies if it can be used incorrectly or used in a way to harm yourself or society. So that's where there is a little bit of a gap there for, for even though I, I don't think free will exists, but I think there might be some leeway of, of, of tuning things a little bit to your liking. Yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree. And um, okay, so honey, I'm gonna let you go in the next five minutes. I'll let you go sure. catch up with your football. But I just wanted to ask you, obviously, you decided to, I'm not sure how long you've, you've actually been on YouTube. I, I came across you a couple of months ago. And then, you know, we only a couple of years ago. Okay, yeah, my, my channel is young a couple of years ago. Oh, nice. So could you just tell my audience a little bit? Because I, obviously I know what we found out. You're a polyglot today, but I've seen a lot of your bilingual topics. Um, and uh, obviously I, I, I listen to all your English content more. Uh, but yeah, if you could just kind of enlighten us. So, so what what drove you to kind of come on and do this and, and where are you going with your channel? Uh, so I've started my channel trying to, uh, I wasn't trying to collide directly uh, with religion, but I wanted to raise awareness because I think religion isn't uh, the reason for every single failing uh, in the Middle East or, or those who still believe in religion, but it's the, the, the ignorance, really. Um, there's a lot of um, failed educational systems where, uh, because I, I still maintain you could be somebody who's religious uh, and at least uh, your religion does not le let you sort of... Um, um, attack others or uh, defy science. There is a lot of Muslim scientists who, when they, they enter the lab, they, they sort of not abandon God, but they put the faith thing aside and they follow the scientific method and they're, they're cool. We can live along, not a problem whatsoever. Um, so I, I, I was trying to more uh, bring uh, issues of philosophy, epistemology, like how do we know that we know? sort of say, uh, what's epistemology? What are reliable sources? So I want to basically strike the, the reliability of a narration of a chain of uh, a story. Like, you know, it's, a, it's basically the Hadith is playing telephone or, or you know, <laughs> yeah. the Chinese whisper. You know, I think telephone. Mm -hmm. The telephone uh, game, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you do this experiment with 20 kids and you, you'd be laughing at the very last kid because they will be doing and saying something completely different than what was uttered. Um, initially, imagine doing this over fourteen hundred years and and have geographical divides, and so I'm sure the story would have changed. So when I engage epistemology and how do we know what we know and what is what is the definition of, of epistemology of what is justified true belief? What does it entail? And can it that can that be be applicable to the knowledge they got about Islam, Indir slightly indirectly, but eventually get there. And get them mm -hmm. to probe. And you can actually use that skill in multiple things in your life. Even after you abandon religion, especially when biases come in hand. So Johnny Depp, uh, Amber, uh, what's her name? Uh, Amber Heard. Amber Heard. Yeah. Um, it depends on your where you are and, and, and who you're going to believe. Are you a feminist? Are you a crazy feminist who's going to say, I'm going to believe the woman regardless? Or are mm -hmm. you a Johnny Depp fan? Who thinks mm -hmm. Johnny Depp, you know, you know, absolutely, or he can never, you know, uh, the butter wouldn't melt in his mouth, sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so, and you'll find you'll catch him a lot of biases in between. And where is the truth? Where is truly the truth? Are we going to get to know the truth ever? Uh, or, or the truth is somewhere mixed in between and, and, and whoever can manipulate information and come up with a better story will always win the day. So this is a qu quite interesting. But I'm watching this and I'm not taking sides. 
and I'm going to be watching this and I'm going, this is very, it's it's not, it's above gossip or, or, or trivia or um, uh, that kind of thing. For me, it's a, it's a very interesting situation because it's allegations and it's a post, uh, how do we find out the truth and where, where our biases are going to lead us uh, to, but we do that every day. We do that every day without realizing. Yeah. We, we believe those who we like and we don't believe those who we don't like, even though the, the, the ones that we, who we don't like might be the honest ones at some point, but we were geared to believe those who we like or we find attractive or we find witty or funny. It's crazy. The human brain is quite deceiving. Yeah, a hundred percent. And our brain has so many even like precon like like tendencies naturally in itself in the way that we're like more pattern seeking as humans. So if we see a pattern of some kind, we're more likely to kind of, you know, believe that or, or find some meaning in that. And we've got a lot of these kind of like twerks, as you said, and they all infringe the unbiased nature of the way we are going about our search for the truth. Um, which is why I really appreciate it, because obviously what you've studied and the fact that you speak so many languages, you kind of can bring all of that together and they lend itself really well to the conversations you have, which are like, imagine a cluttered room and you're just kind of like unpacking it and clearing it out slowly, slowly, and just kind of narrowing the, the issues and the trajectory to what is essentially lending us, if not closer to the truth, but asking the right questions, which will help us get there. Um, so I really, really appreciate what you've been doing. And I think it's absolutely fantastic, especially for me. I'm I'm even more grateful that you reaching out in the state. If you're doing the exact same kind of content in Arabic or, you know, slightly tweaking it for the Arab audience, I think that's really important. Again, like when these kind of conversations are, are pushing the boundaries of English, when they're happening in Urdu, in like the Pakistani scene, when they're happening in Hindi, in the Indian scene, when they're happening in Arabic, especially these countries where religion has dominated the psyche for so long that, you know, most of the previous generations have not even thought about anything to the contrary. But now as we see people questioning more and the internet having every, everything readily available, people are asking all the right questions and the fact that we can push the boundaries and, and you know, joke about them. There's movies out there as well. Yeah, um, I'm just laughing at Harris. Um, is he, uh, is he is there, creating is, a scene in the chat? Fellow, What's he saying? A fellow Aussie. Um, uh, <laughs> I must be a Jordan <laughs> Peterson fan because my room is immaculate. <laughs> Actually, I disagree uh, with Jordan Peterson on a lot of yes. things. Yes. Okay. I, I'm not. I'm not a Jordan. No, I find him. I find him interesting, though. He's very complex. The guy's complex. Uh, I find him interesting, but. Um, I don't buy his um, his uh, metaphorical truth and uh, uh, idea and the Jungian archetype and trying to smuggle Jesus. <laughs> so yeah, Harris. yeah. <laughs> literally <laughs> smuggle Jesus. <laughs> Strong, smuggle Christian morality he's, in there. Just the he's salt a smuggler. Base. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a smuggler, and what did you say Allah was earlier? The schemer, not the best of deceivers. They call him the schemer, yeah, schemer right? <laughs> Kind of a more sort of an intro, you know, it's more sophisticated word, you know. You know it is, it, it, it's not it, outright it, deception, it's like very highly thought about. Scheming. Yeah, it's, it's kind of the thing you do when you have a cigar and a brandy, kind of. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, Steve, not, <laughs> with your leather armchair. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and Horace is saying, I am too. He doesn't, I don't think he agrees with everything Jordan Peterson says, he was just poking fun at you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you're you're based in Melbourne as well, aren't you, honey? If I'm not yes, mistaken. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh yeah, the C two B. This is this is what I agree. I agree as well. For, for to, you know, to a large extent, I agree. There's obviously like this needs unpacking too. But overall, he's a very very smart man. But again, as as honey was saying, these, you know, the smuggling. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think Jordan Peterson is religious. I really don't think he is. Really, I think you think Jordan, it's a bit of an act? No, no, no. I think he's more like Nietzschean. Um, because Nietzsche, when he said God is dead in his um, uh, Zarathustra um, uh, novel, uh, he was, uh, when 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 uh, it was claimed that God was dead, he wasn't partying, he wasn't celebrating. He was mm -hmm. quite alarmed, annoyed, because he, he thought he was afraid of humanity, for humanity to sort of uh, like fall into oblivion, because mm -hmm. we're not ready. Uh, he, he's afraid for because remember, remember, and this is where you have to be careful in a in a in a in a in a remote Pakistani village or an Egyptian village where people cannot write write and read. 
and they don't know the difference between basic knowledge and life. And you take away religion, be careful of that vacuum that you can leave. You're going to have to fill up first with something else. Uh, morals that can stand on its own feet. Um, a bit of knowledge, a bit of ways of approaching knowledge and, and obtaining knowledge. But if you take away um, the probably the one thing that keeps them sort of sane or keeps them, uh, the repercussions might be quite dangerous. So, and that's why knowledge is very important. That's why what you guys keep exposing bad ideas and other people giving lectures on science and bits. You need all of that happening together at the same time. But that's why Nietzsche and even Karl Marx, when he talks about uh, the religion as the opiates of the people, again, he's been misquoted. He, he actually, if you complete the sentence and he says, and, and the awe and the, um, uh, the cry of the uh, of the, uh, the sort of kind of the the broken soul type of thing. It's a he, he's mentioning it in a, on a consoling type of term that yeah, you know, almost like a therapeutic, it, like the opium of the masses. It keeps them all kind of like in that happy days, yeah. if you well, will. People yeah. call these two Nietzsche and Karl Marx out of context, uh, and, and that's something I don't like because that that dishonesty about bringing just the first sentence to to get you to where you want to be, but not finishing at all. Because uh, I think these oh, you two must are love here. Muslim imams, then, honey. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, but they don't mind you. They don't mind quoting you that you're saying things out of context <laughs> when it suits them. <laughs> yeah, that's out of context. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. Yeah. The con contextual is very subjective in this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, thank you so much for that. I'll just run through the some of the super chats really quickly, and then we can wrap this sure. up. Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. I also just want to, um, awesome, thank you. I just want to also share Hani's channel with you guys. This is Critical Faculty um, with the wonderful Einstein there. So as you can see, Hani's got like a bunch of videos and they, I think they alternate, right, Hani? English, Arabic, English, Arabic? Um, or... not, not necessarily in that order. So if you maybe go to the playlists, mm -hmm. um, uh, on the right hand side of the video um, and then you can find the English conversations and obviously if somebody's sort of can understand Arabic they can uh, see the Arabic contents but I do have the English uh, contents on its own um, and I have conversation I'm going to have another conversation with Lawrence Krauss that's mm -hmm. going to be his sixth time to appear in critical faculty I'm going to have Michael Shermer again uh, I have people like Dan Barker Obviously, Robert Price, I've got a weekly episode with Robert Price now. Uh, but I've got different um, uh, uh, type of English speakers. We, we speak philosophy, uh, science. Uh, Dave Farina from uh, Professor Dave. We do we do uh, biogenesis. Uh, Aaron Ra. So people like that, we, we, we tend to sort of have a conversation with. But I do have my own material as well. Um, plus, I do Clubhouse audio rooms as well for people like they want to listen to a conversation while they're driving a car. So it's just an audio only uh, type of material. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause I came across that clubhouse thing and then I was trying, I was listening to the Arabic ones cause I'm really trying to improve my Arabic oh, really? <laughs> you guys. Yeah. Um, so I save the Arabic ones to try and listen to and I, I kind of follow actually, it's just when it gets like a bit, you know, intense, I'm like, Oh, I need to go back to English. I don't know what they're saying here, but wow. yeah, so that's really good. I like that you have a, a, a nice kind of combination and, and just the listening as well really, really helps. Cause, um, the stuff you've done with Robert Price and when it was all kind of kicking off, I think with uh, myth vision as well, and you had him back. Yeah. And I yeah. was like, wow, I, I wanted to hear him clarify. And I think the way you handled that conversation, again, I just really like your style. It's very Socratic in your approach to, to handle really, really hot topics. Maria, in all honesty, that's why I'm still friends with both of them. And, mm. and there are, I just don't understand the cancel culture. I, I don't think mm. it does anything when you cancel somebody. Uh, if you disagree with their opinion, you want to engage with them because you want to either change their opinion or show that the, the world did wrong. Cancelling them out of the of the, uh, the equation, it doesn't take the, the problem hasn't gone away. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? You actually give them that chance to kind of like 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 clear it up for the masses in general as well, because you've almost been tarnished with you know what you you get tarnished with one of those words these days, and you're almost done for. So the fact that you give them a chance to unpack what can ordinarily 
seem like something completely cancelable, you kind of, you know, you step back and you say, let's just let's just discuss this from even though I'm coming from the complete opposite end, where how far can we meet in the middle? And it was a very, very constructive conversation. And that's why I think I really wanted to have you on my channel as well, because I'm not here to be like nah, 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 Muslims and all confrontational. I just like conversations where I can genuinely learn something for the other from the other person. And it's more of like a fruitful discussion as opposed to, you know, any form of like hardcore, let's just go at each other and or like bash sure. religion. Like it's it's not what it's supposed to be. Um but yeah, so please go ahead and subscribe to Hani's channel. As you can see, he's got so many amazing guests. And if you do speak Arabic, this is like a treasure trove for you. Um so real quick before we wrap up, I will let you guys get to your football and enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Um just the super chats real quick. Secular Sakai said, keep thinking outside the box or the Kaaba in particular. Like <laughs> Nouria, thank yeah, I like that too. Definitely think outside that box, that's for sure. Uh, thank you so much, Secular Sakai, for your uh, support and for being here. Um, and then we had a question from Stop Scamming Man. Let me just bring it up. Here we go. Uh, Stop Scamming Man, thank you so much for your super chat and for watching. I hope you enjoyed our chat. Uh, Stop Scamming Man is saying, as shown in YouTube video, Sheikh Uthman caught lying about enslaving women and children. Uthman wants a new caliphate that does wars of aggression and, ens and enslavement. He intends to visit the UK soon. Maybe a petition should stop him coming. Um, yeah, I actually did not know that uh, he was planning to come to the UK. I also don't follow him that much. I try not to follow Muslim sheikhs because they really bring bring me down. I don't need to listen to that kind of stuff. I'd say but, let um, him in, yeah. let him in, and put him under scrutiny. Put him in a, in a mm -hmm. room and say, "Well, okay, well, tell us what what's in your mind." <laughs> That's the thing. I don't think that. I mean, the petition is obviously a good idea where there's like a real, like you know, safety issue. But I think in the UK we have this space where let's just let them in, as Hani's saying. Let's get them to the university or wherever they want to lecture and talk, and you know, let the opposite. Let them use their free speech card and let them defend what they're saying and say these things out loud in 2022, and let's see the public response to it. Um, we've seen people like Mariam Namazi from the Council of Ex-Muslim Britain was doing this like years ago, kind of going to the universities and and counter, um, you know, like like speaking about the actual facts of Sharia law counter to what these imams propagate in their mosques, which they're, they, they're more than free to do in England. Uh, but to her, she, she dealt with so much scrutiny from these like Muslim goons that would come and sit in the front seat and antagonize her and try and throw her off her presentation. Um, and again, that's just so disrespectful, but that speaks to Muslim behavior. I think in the West in 2022, we should be able to let him be here, listen to what he's saying. The second he incites, you know, actual violence or exactly. calls for violence, you nip it in the bud. That, that's the laws we have yeah. in place. Remember, but, remember um, Nuria, bad yeah. and evil ideas sort of flourish in darkness. You want to mm -hmm. you wanna shed the light on them so you can demolish them once and for all. That's the only way you can demolish bad and evil ideas. Uh, they love the darkness. They love to fist her in, in, in the, the darkness of ignorance. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. That, and, and that's very true. Exactly. So we need to put, you know, shine light on these issues and say, nope, that doesn't happen anymore. But, but shutting them and locking them away and keeping them out is not going to help that the more they speak in a way it, it's, it's actually easier for us to do our job because we can say, look at what they're propagating. And this, this is going against the very basics of, you know, the, the fundamental laws we have in place here. So he could, by all means, he can believe that, but there's no way that anything can come of it, especially coming to the UK and trying to spout nonsense like this. But again, I could go on about the UK because, we, you know, it, I think they could strive harder to tackle extremist ideology a little bit more. But that's a conversation for another day. So thank you, Stop Scamming Man. And Norse Mythology, a regular mod and supporter. Thank you so much for being here and for your super sticker and for being an amazing mod. Um, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. And then we had AD5. Thank you so much for your super sticker. Um, yeah, I guess thank you so much for your support, everybody. Uh, oh, Stop Scamming Man is following up. Thank you again. I'm against Uthman being censored completely and utterly. I don't want his social media inhibited in any way. However, stopping him entering Britain would send the right message in my view. Yeah, so again, this is what I'm saying. Uh, Britain has not acted, um, you know, in, in, in so many ways where they could just be a little come down a bit harder because 
there are parts of the UK which are becoming real serious threats in terms of like pockets of uh, Muslim communities where, you know, we have no control over what's being spouted in those khutbas, uh, so like the sermons at the mosque and things like that. And we like the radicalization that's happening through like within families in these areas. I shared a video on Twitter the other day of this man in England having his two young sons walk towards the ISIS flag and kiss it like basically swearing allegiance to it and they're filming this in their front garden in England and it's like you know you're, you're living here and you are literally swearing allegiance to a terrorist organization uh, and you've kind of imprinted that in your children so no matter what those children aren't going to be going to a primary school and you know you can bet like <laughs> you can bet your best like rags that they're not going to be assimilating and integrating with children from other faiths and it's very problematic but I mean, no, stopping no, yeah. and entering, I think, would have a huge backlash. There we go. Ahead. Yeah, my, my only problem with this approach, or my only fear, rather, mm -hmm. is, you know, how um, uh, this situation could end up making him a hero, and it would be used as, oh, look at, look at them. They're afraid of the truth. They're shutting down the truth. If they were brave enough and as transparent enough, why well, don't want to hear us out and hear our argument? They're doing that because they're afraid of the truth. And you're going to get young, impressionable people who will start adopting in an underground movement his ideas and ideologies in the UK and might end up doing things on the ground that uh, can have huge, huge repercussions. So I would rather bring this guy and bring... A lot of intellectuals in a in a in a town hall and trap them and say, "Okay, you tell us why it's good for society. Advocate for your idea." Like back in the day, I think you, in in the UK, you guys have um, the conversations that happen in the Oxford and and, and Cambridge, where you have mm. a, a proper full on a conversation and a debate about a topic, and bring them along. And I think ideas are ideas like that needs to be defeated right in the light. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and and I agree with you that the the hero that he could become, that's what I was saying, the potential like backfiring that that could have, the banning of him, is because especially Muslims, if they feel like one of their big mans or their big shots is, is, is victimized or vilified, they will jump on that. And like Hani's saying, that could inspire such a kind of like, you know, a huge kind of momentum behind it. And again, people who have a soft spot for him and and cling to his ideology and his thought processes could just take that to a, a whole other level. Also, we are in England in 2022. We've got places like Speaker's Corner and stuff, which, you know, despite what's happened there recently and, and how kind of unsafe it is for certain people like, um, quote unquote, ex-Muslims or even ex-Christians, uh, sorry, Christian ex-Muslims, like what happened to Khatun, um, it is, it, we, this is the marketplace of ideas. So as Hani's saying, let him come and let him spew his ideas and let's 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 challenge those ideas all the way to the core and let's see how long, you know, he can stand up to to, to the, the, these claims and these propagations of the worldview that he wants. It just won't fly. They've got their own fans, but on the grand scheme of things, what he's saying Don't is you so have, uh, I, mean, I was thinking of D Douglas Murray. I think Douglas Murray would be a good one to bring to this chat. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, honey, I was going to say, you should fly over for this, mate, as well. <laughs> Come uh, get him. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring you some tomatoes and uh, eggs. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> now, now, we need an intellectual uh, fight. <laughs> I still have some primitive ape, despite all the sophistication, you know, I'm still an ape. <laughs> <laughs> it still comes down to, let's chuck some eggs in there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, thank you so much, Stop Slang Man. I hope that does answer your question and kind of gives you like our views on it. Um, other than that, I just wanted to say Hassan Radwan was saying, great live stream, Nouria. Awesome seeing you, honey. Much love, mate. Oh, you guys are like reunited today. I'm happy. We, we were in a forum at 20, some 20, almost 20 years ago now um, uh, on the ex Muslims of, I can't remember, Britain or. And we were exchanging. We were all working under uh, different sort of aliases and and, 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 and and code names. I think I used to be called Old Brains with the Einstein <laughs> low. And we all sort of hiding then, you know. It, it was fun, but it was fun. And the amount of um, uh, of fun we used to have chatting and dissecting everything together, it was fun times for sure. Oh, I can imagine. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall for those conversations, honestly. Um, but yeah, so that was like all pre when you guys were all in the closet in a way, like under pseudonyms and stuff. This <laughs> is this is what this movement has gone through, people. 
Um, but yeah, I think I think that's it. Oh, CEMB forum back when ex-Muslim wasn't a thing. Okay, yeah, <laughs> good old days. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh wow. Um, so, but I think I don't know. Horace joined. I don't know if he had a question or anything, but he has dropped off. So, um, Hani, I'll let you go watch the footy, and I could talk to you for hours. Honestly, we could have gone into I any know, more. I was going to so suggest, Naria, that's part two of this conversation. I'm going to uh, return the favor and thank you for being such a gracious uh, host, and you've got beautiful, uh, very smart audiences. Uh, I can I can see the the, the, the top of conversations you're having so you're very lucky that way i uh, i get some mixed bags i've got a lot of um, uh, arabic uh, people uh, commenting and sometimes the uh, the complete uh, non sequiturs the otter is just <laughs> driving me mad <laughs> but uh, uh, we can do the second part on my channel in the next few a couple of weeks if you wish yeah sure i'd absolutely love to it would be my pleasure like I said we can talk for hours that's why even today um it was nothing like preempted we didn't have a set forum we were literally like let's just have a chat and, and see what comes out but i did want to kind of get like this holistic view on, on you and your journey and how you are so like just just so great in your approach now and i think you have brought it to light so thank you so much for sharing that with us and um with my audience and for the compliments to my audience because who, guys, whoever you are, my entire audience, you get so many compliments. Whenever I'm live with somebody, they're li looking at the chat and they're like, your audience is so funny and clever and witty. And I'm like, I love you all. Whoever's giving us this great rep, guys, keep it coming. This is amazing. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely have Hani back on here as well. I think Hani will will choose a topic that's kind of really of interest and we can, we can go ham on a topic like that. And yes, pun intended, because Islam bans ham. <laughs> 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 but yeah honey uh anything you want to say and then we can we can wrap it up no this is fantastic uh, i've enjoyed my time so much i think we we talked about maybe we can do start some sort of a series but back and forth home and away games <laughs> yeah. between your channel and my channel and we can start taking some ideas like you know evolution and and bits and pieces and 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 maybe um you know because i'm not interested in attacking religion sort of directly but in a way if you end up talking about evolution or physics it eventually it's gonna uh, bring religion to scrutiny but maybe in a rather indirect way yeah no for sure and and as i said you know this this post leaving religion aspect this whole window that you delve into i am all there so anything you want to kind of discuss in that sphere of things i'm more than happy to because i learned so much from you honey so i i actually have to tip my hat off to you i've learned so much from you and i really appreciate you so what you're doing thank you i've enjoyed my time thank you you're very welcome okay everybody have a fab saturday go have some fun enjoy yourselves until next time Bye bye